So we have a range of heat pulse velocity methods and the, the natural question to ask is uh, which method should I use or, or which method is most appropriate for my research? So as part of that review paper that I mentioned earlier in this talk, I went through the literature and did a meta-analysis of all the different studies that compared the accuracy of these different methods. So the way you compare the accuracy is you measure your heat pulse velocity and then you compare it with an independent measure of sat flow. So that might be say a lysimeter or a wave scale or gravimetric technique. Or you can see in this image here, this is what we call the cut stem technique. So up this end of the figure, we have a hose um, that's connected um, through an airtight uh, mechanism at this side of the trunk. Then we have our heat pulse velocity sensor in the trunk and we can apply water through the trunk at known pressures or at known velocities. And at that known velocity, we can measure the heat pulse velocity and then do a correlation between the two techniques. So through these various methods that are out there, we can test the accuracy of the heat pulse velocity methods and see which one is most useful for us. So the biggest difference between the various heat pulse methods is the, the minimum range that they can measure. So your Tmax and your compensation heat pulse method only can measure to a minimum range of about five centimeters per hour, or, or give or take. The heat ratio method on the other hand can measure down to negative 10 centimeters per hour. So the heat ratio method, whether it be the Marshall Burgess or the Marshall Hogg method, can measure reverse, zero and slow rates of sap flow. Whereas your Tmax and your compensation heat pulse methods cannot mathematically and physically measure zero or slow rates of reverse of flow, and they can certainly cannot measure reverse flow. So here is an example of some data from a compensation heat pulse method where it cannot measure zero or reverse flow. So on, the, on this axis here, we have our heat pulse velocity, and on this axis over here, we have our global solar radiation. So in the graph, the blue line is your heat pulse velocity from the compensation heat pulse method. And the red line is your solar radiation. And at these points here, you can see solar radiation is zero. So this is our nighttime. And we would also expect the heat pulse velocity to come down to zero um, at night. So it may not come down to zero because there could be some nighttime sap flow, but we see these very clear cutoff values, which suggests that the the actual sensor cannot measure below that point. So in this particular example, that cutoff, cutoff value is 1.8 centimeters per hour, uh, but depending on other plants, it could be um, three centimeters or four centimeters per hour. Um, there's been some examples where it's even been up to 10 or more centimeters per hour. The heat ratio method, on the other hand, can measure slow, zero and reverse rates of sap flow. So here's a couple of examples of uh, sap flow being measured in roots of plants. So in the top graph, we have examples of slow rates of flow. So between zero and five centimeters per hour is a fairly slow rate of sap flow. And in this case, the sensor is quite, it's measuring quite accurately. In the bottom graph, we have an example of reverse flow. So here in the grayed out area, we have values that are less than zero, and we call this reverse sap flow. And you can see here that there are values being recorded less than zero. So the heat ratio method is capable of measuring at zero and reverse rates of flow. So the heat ratio method is great at measuring reverse and slow rates of flow. However, when you try to measure high rates of flow, unfortunately the heat ratio method um, falls over. So we say that the maximum value that the heat ratio can measure is about 45 centimeters per hour. The Tmax and the compensation heat pulse methods, on the other hand, can theoretically measure very high rates of flow. Um, so we have examples where they can measure over 200 centimeters per hour. So the highest example I've, I've come across in the literature is 266 centimeters per hour in soybean that was published by Cohen et al. in 1993. So the Tmax and compensation heat pulse methods can potentially measure very high rates of flow whereas the heat ratio method can only measure up to moderate rates of flow. So a study conducted by Pearsall et al. in 2014 highlights very nicely the difference between the heat ratio method and the compensation heat pulse method 
at high rates of flow. So in this inset up here, we have the black line is the heat ratio method and the gray line is your compensation heat pulse method. And you can see here that the black line is more or less stopping at about 30 centimeters per hour, whereas the gray line is getting above 50 centimeters per hour. And in this day over here, it's above 150 centimeters per hour. In the larger graph down the bottom here, we have an extended data set of about two weeks. And we can see that quite consistently, the heat ratio method is stopping at about 30 centimeters per hour, but the compensation heat pulse method is measuring well above 200 centimeters per hour. So at high flows with the heat ratio method, what you see is a flat top or U-shaped data. And that means that that method can no longer measure at high rates of flow. So the natural question to ask is why can't the heat ratio method, and this includes both the, the Marshall Burgess and the Marshall Hogg method, why can't they measure at high rates of flow? And it all comes back to the probe configuration. So you might or just think back to a few previous slides where we looked at the probe configuration and we have the heater and the downstream probe and the upstream probe and the distance between them is only six millimeters. And the heat ratio method, you would also recall, measures the temperature at 60 seconds after the heat pulse. So what we can simply ask ourselves is, is what distance has the heat pulse traveled up the stem or what distance has the heat pulse traveled downstream uh, 60 seconds after the heat pulse? So here's a, uh, just a couple of examples here. And, and these diagrams on this graph are just meant for conceptual reasons. Um, so don't take them too, too literally. But what we have here is our um, probe configuration with the heat ratio method. And then we have our heat pulse, which is a red circle. And then this ellipse around the red circle is just our heat field from the heat pulse. So in this first graph over here, we have an example of heat velocity at 20 centimeters per hour. So 60 seconds after the heat pulse, the heat pulse has traveled three and a half millimeters downstream from the heater probe. So here it is here. After 60 seconds, it is three and a half millimeters downstream and it's well within the measurement zone of the downstream temperature probe. But when heat velocity is 45 centimeters per hour, so at the upper limit of the heat ratio method, the heat pulse has now traveled seven and a half millimeters downstream 60 seconds after the heat pulse. So the heat pulse has now traveled beyond the temperature probe and beyond the influence of where the temperature, the downstream temperature probe can measure. So at higher heat velocities, the heat pulse travels further and further up the stem and beyond the measurement zone of the downstream temperature probe and it just basically escapes being measured. So that's why the heat ratio method cannot measure at high rates of flow. So we see some differences at the, the minimum range and the maximum range between the different methods. So we also want to know is how accurate are the methods in estimating real SAT flow or, or real SAT velocity. So then we want to look at the, the error and the precision of our measurements. So we see here that the Tmax has an error of about 33%, compensation heat pulse about 14%, and heat ratio method about 19%. And the precision with the Tmax is quite good, it's um, 87%, compensation heat pulse is about 76, and the heat ratio method is about, uh, it's very good at about 96% um, precision. So what do we mean by when we say error and precision? Well, this graph here on this slide uh, demonstrates what we mean by those terms. So this particular example is a compensation heat pulse measuring on a grapevine. And the independent measure of transpiration or sap velocity was a canopy, some kind of canopy conductance chamber. Now the graph that you see here, it's actually, this is what you see for all the heat pulse methods and, and indeed even other sap flow methods such as your thermal dissipation or your, your Granier technique and your stem heat balance techniques as well. So even though we're looking at the compensation heat pulse method in this graph, this particular graph is very similar to what you would see with any sap flow technique. So we have heat pulse velocity on our y-axis and the independent measure on the x-axis. And the one-to-one -one line here, which is the dotted line, if our data was exactly, if our heat pulse velocity was predicting exactly sap velocity, 
then all of our data would be falling on this one-to-one -one line and you wouldn't see any scatter in the data either. But what we actually do see is that there is this underestimation between um, measured sat flow and what true sat flow should be. And in this case, the slope of the line is less than one, it's 0.72. So, and this is the, the same for any particular sat flow method that you would come across. They all underestimate true sat flow. But the scatter in the data, so where all these dots are, um, the scatter between them is actually quite low. Um, so we have an R squared of 0.97. So our precision is very high. So even though we are consistently underestimating true sat velocity or true sat flow, the precision in our data is very good. So it's just a matter of correcting for an offset in all of the different sat flow techniques.